And before we hear the reading of God's word from the book of Acts chapter 10, let us pray the prayer of illumination as we ask God to help us. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. And hear this, the word of God from Acts chapter 10. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. We are all witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they invited him to stay several days. We have heard the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's okay to interrupt church. Did I ever tell you the time that I was shouted down in church? No? Well, not our church, of course. This was many, many years ago at the first church I ever pastored, a small country church in the middle of a pine forest in Mississippi. I was in college and this was a great opportunity for me to make all the mistakes I needed to make so that one day I would avoid making those mistakes in Poughkeepsie. You can send them a thank you note. Anyway, on my first Sunday we had 11 people. Over the course of a year we grew steadily and soon we had 30, 40, 50, 60 people coming and one of those people who started coming was a guy I called Big Mike. Big Mike. Imagine how big someone has to be for me to call them big. Now, Big Mike didn't grow up going to church, but he came with his wife and their daughters. He was friendly, he was outgoing, he was a supervisor at one of the local manufacturing plants. And on one Sunday morning, I finished preaching and we were singing the final hymn, and we were about to say our blessings and our goodbyes, and all of a sudden, I hear shouting. Now, in a country church, that's not uncommon, but it's still a bit startling. So on we go to verse 2, and then the shouting is louder, but this time it's something completely different. Stop the music, Brother Jason, stop it. And I look over, and it's Big Mike. He is crying and he is taking a step away from his seat into the aisle. Wait, he's not only stepping into the aisle, he's stepping forward. Wait, Big Mike is walking toward me, shouting something, and he's gaining speed. Well, then he falls into my arms, and I stab her uh, back, and I regain my balance, and his head falls right onto my chest. And he is right on my microphone. And he is shouting, stop the music, stop the music. 
So we go from singing to shouting to silence. And like any confused person who is evaluating if I may or may not have pulled a muscle in my back, I say, uh, what's going on, buddy? <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. Big Mike shouts, I need to become a Christian. I need to become a Christian. I've been coming and I've been singing and I've been praying and I've been hearing your sermons and it's time that I did it. It's time that I become a Christian. You see, I didn't have to announce it because he cried it and yelled it right into my microphone. So everyone heard it. Everyone cheers and is clapping and his family is crying and we're all happy. And he and I have a conversation right in front of everyone as he confesses his faith in Christ right then and there. The next week we have his baptism and we all rejoice at that interruption. Feel free in the future to interrupt me for that. In our passage today, Peter's sermon gets interrupted. That's what we read in verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the spirit fell. Sometime it's good to be interrupted. And though this passage on this Easter Sunday is not from one of the Gospels, it is filled with the good news and Easter message of Jesus Christ. That it is a very insightful passage because it reveals to us the power and the heart of Christianity. That Easter is not just about what happened in the past, but what God continues to do in the present through the retelling and the preaching and the receiving of that message. You see, Easter tells us that we worship a God who interrupts our regularly scheduled life. And he does that so that he can do subtle and amazing works that change us. So as we get into our passage, let me tell you about Cornelius. Cornelius is a commanding officer over 100 soldiers. He's a Gentile and he's Roman. He's not Jewish like Peter which we can take to mean that Cornelius grew up with a different cultural, a different religious, and a different spiritual background than Peter. Cornelius's successful career has put him in the regional seat of the Roman government, the city of Caesarea, named after Caesar. He has a family, he has household servants, he has the big three, power, money, and influence. And yet something is lacking in his life. And during his time in Judea, which is the same territory Jesus walked and talked and worked miracles from time to time, Cornelius, this Roman pagan Gentile, begins attending synagogue. Now, praise God for those faithful men and women in the synagogue who showed Cornelius kindness. Imagine that situation. Here is a commanding officer of the occupying country that is occupying your country and he steps inside your place of worship and over time your faithfulness your prayers and your way of life and belief changes him he adopts a lifestyle of prayer and almsgiving which is showing generosity to those who are experiencing hardship power money influence a great regularly scheduled life, yet he is still searching. Those things aren't enough. He's spiritually hungry. Over time, Cornelius develops a reputation for being genuinely devout. And through an amazing set of events, he's able to locate Peter and invites Peter to come to teach him about Jesus. So Peter comes and he's standing in front of Cornelius and Cornelius' household, which would have been his family and his employees. And Peter does a great job of talking about the past, but also talking about the present. He mixes in what happened in history with what is happening inside of himself. He says, Cornelius, this is what I'm learning. Notice the present tense. This is what I'm learning. The first Easter is living within Peter 
and it continues to shape his life. Cornelius, this is what I'm learning. I'm Jewish, and I was raised a certain way, taught to believe, act, and pray a certain way. But now, because of Jesus and God's work in my life, I see that God's favor is not just for me and for people like me, but it's for everyone. And undoubtedly, Cornelius, you have walked the same roads Jesus walked. You've seen the same countryside. You've heard people talk about Jesus. His ministry started in Galilee after he was baptized by John. God anointed Jesus with the Spirit, and then he went about teaching people and healing those who were sick and oppressed. And he could do that, Cornelius, because God was with him. And at the end of his life, Jesus was crucified, or as we sometimes say, hung on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day. And we know this because he appeared to a group of us. I was in that group. And when, once when we were together, Jesus breathed on us and said, Receive my spirit. And then he commanded us to go out and to preach to all kinds of people and to testify that he is the one on the everlasting throne. So Cornelius, that's what I was doing before you sent for me. I was obeying Jesus. And that's why I'm standing in front of you today. And Cornelius, you and I have probably sat in the same synagogues. And you and I both have heard readings from the prophetic scrolls. It is to Jesus all of these prophets bear witness. And as Peter takes a deep breath to finish the rest of his sermon, he's interrupted. Imagine the audacity of God, or the kindness. In verse 44 we read, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. Which means opening their minds so they could understand. Opening their hearts so that they could believe. You see, the same Spirit that fell upon Jesus in his baptism which was then followed by the voice that said, this is my son, the one in whom I am well pleased. It's that same spirit that fell upon Cornelius and his household and said, and you are my children, with you I am well pleased. Then they were baptized, which is a sign of radical inclusion in multiple ways. It's inclusion by the church. What is happening in Cornelius' baptism is this, is that the early Christians were Jewish, and they're saying to Cornelius and his household, though you are a foreigner, though you are not like us, though you don't have a certain religious knowledge or a certain religious background, you are family, and you're going to be treated equal. What God says about me is what God says about you. Second, it's radical acceptance by God. Baptism is like a bear hug from Big Mike. God in baptism says, I will never let you go. I am your God forever. There is nothing that will ever separate me from you. Now, aren't you glad for Cornelius and the others that God is willing to interrupt a preacher? I know I am. I know I am. Now, let's talk about us for just a minute. I think that you would agree that this stay-at-home order is interrupting our life. Yes? Yes? I could hear the amens. Now, the question is this. What can I learn from God through this interruption? Within this interruption, God can work in big and subtle ways. And I purposely say subtle because sometimes, yes, God does these big, enormous things that are amazing and we give God glory for that. But sometimes God chooses to use a soft touch, even in the midst of large scale happenings. The prophet Elijah bore witness to this, that the word of God did not come to him in the great strong wind that broke apart the rocks on the mountain. 
that God's revelation to him did not happen in the terror of the shaking earthquake or in the crackling heat of the consuming fire, but that after the wind left and after the earthquake was over and after the fire died down, what was left that touched Elijah was a still, small voice. And as I close, I wonder if over the past several weeks, if there have been moments where maybe you have felt nudged, something like a small, a still small voice wanting to help you, saying to you, pay attention to this, this is important, that that voice is speaking to you like it did Cornelius, a prompting uh, to you to pursue deep faith, uh, kindness and generosity, a prompting for you to develop more of your relationship with God and a desire to know more about Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, what is God showing you right now? Are there any revelations, any guidance or wisdom that you've received? Embrace the interruption. Embrace this new way of living because it's often in these interruptions where our regularly scheduled life is kind of put on the side for a few moments or for several moments that God can teach us new things in new and sometimes familiar ways. So, friends, let us all, by the grace and empowerment of God, allow the one who broke through the grave break into our hearts also. And let's cultivate some humility within ourselves to allow God to break into our regularly scheduled life, to bless us and to send us into the world to know and to love and to serve God and others so that all people in all places may bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Friends, blessings of Easter to you. We have heard the word of the Lord and thanks be to God.